please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gisela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and if you are new here, welcome! I hope that you'll stick around, subscribe, welcome to all my moderators, thank you so much for everything you do, to all my patrons, YouTube members. By the way, if you are a YouTube member and you missed yesterday's members only live stream, go check it out. It's on the community tab, it's on the members only playlist as well. And welcome to all the Grizzlies, all the existing subscribers. We even have <laughs> T-Y-O, toys, you said this trial will be rad. I know, right? Welcome. So if you guys have never heard of this case, it's the Corey Richens case, right? It's actually Eric Richens case, the victim. But Corey Richens is the one that's going to be hopefully on trial. I say that because they've still got an evidentiary hearing coming up, you know, preliminary hearing to decide if they have enough to go to trial. So as far as I understand, there's no trial date set yet. Uh, set yet. It will still be happening. But if you've never heard of this case before, just uh, look in the description box quickly. There's a case background write-up for you. There's also a playlist that I've linked there for you. I did cover this quite extensively when this case uh, was first in the news. And now I noticed I haven't spoken about it for nine months. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> I'm just like, whoa, we have to do some updates over here. You know, there's been a lot of hearings and documents like we see in many cases. Okay. So today what I'm going to do is actually offer you an update. It's going to be a recap bullet points, brief overview, then we're going to dive into some of the new documents, new allegations, okay, including allegedly allegations, suspicions about Corey Richens' mother, which is very interesting as well, and then we're going to look at a few little video clips, all right? <laughs> so if you like that, if you like bullet points, presentations, documents, video clips, things like that, give the video a like and share. Okay, so here's a little presentation I made for you. As I say, I could probably spend a month on this. <laughs> you won't see me for a month just to recap every single thing, but we've got all the main points here, okay? We'll have bullet points. Okay, so just a quick overview. Corey and Eric Richens got married on June 15th of 2013. There's the first typo. Typo one, I need a little typo jar. I need like a piggy bank, okay? 2013, the prenup stated that all assets would remain in Eric's possession if they got divorced, but would be allocated to Corey if he died while they were lawfully married. So why is that listed there? First is because that's a red flag in this case. You know what I mean? F based on how Corey allegedly read that, like, oh. So if we get divorced, he gets everything. But if he dies while we're married, I get everything? You see, you see what I mean? Oh no, <laughs> Carla says, Gizla, don't forget to walk the dog and meet me at the fire pit for Corey. Thank you so much <laughs> for your sticker. All right, so they got married in 2013. They had three sons together, beautiful home. She was a real estate agent and he owned a stone masonry company, C&E Masonry LLC. If you want a deeper dive, there are three live streams that we did before. It's all on the playlist, okay, where we did it a lot slower and I read you a whole lot of articles and things that showed you map time. All of that. So from 2015 to 2017, Corey was already up to mischief, okay? She bought at least four life insurance policies on Eric's life. So we've got four red flags there, all right? Between 2019 and 2020, she allegedly stole money from Eric's bank account, opened an account in his name with a fraudulent power of attorney. He found out, confronted her, and she promised to pay it back, but she never did. And it was approximately $500,000 that was stolen or misused. Now, because she was a real estate agent, she liked to flip houses. She bought, you know, houses with millions of dollars and flipped them and made profit. But sometimes she needed a lot of, a lot of disposable money, you know. <laughs> so, but I think the four life insurance policies, that's a, that's a red flag, right? We're hearing it already. True crime recipe. Also, I think, th I think if I remember correctly, they met at Home Depot. Not at Walmart, I'm just saying. Okay. So October of 2020, 
Eric spoke to a divorce attorney, yes, a divorce lawyer, and he started a trust for his kids, which he then put in his sister's control. Later, he also changed one of his main life insurance policies um, to, his sis- to go to his sister, and Corey didn't initially know about that. So when Eric died and was allegedly murdered, that's what this case is all about. Um, yeah, it's, it's stated that Corey actually punched his sister in an argument about the assets. And she's like, hello, like, everything went to me. And she's like, no, it didn't. So she didn't know about that. Queen Olive, thanks for being a member for nine months. All right, on the bottom right is a picture of their beautiful home. Yeah, um, Lisa says, or Liza, 500k, that's not a mistake. Nope, 500k. She stole a lot of money from him. A lot of bank accounts, a little bit like Kershevsky, huh? By the way, Kershevsky is going to be sentenced this coming Friday. Make sure you are subscribed with all your notifications on because if they are streaming that, which I hope they will, we don't want to miss that. If you don't know who Jesse Kroshevsky is, check out the playlist for the I Drops murder trial. You'll find out. <laughs> okay, so then, no, wait, I can make this a bit bigger again. November of 2020, Eric signed a will that included their three children. I believe all three boys are still they're under the age of 11. Young boys. Again, it's a case where they lost both their parents. Father died, allegedly murdered. Mother sitting in jail. Oh, man. January 1st of 2022, Corey allegedly changed the beneficiary for Eric Richens' $2 million life insurance policy to herself without authorization. The original beneficiary was Eric's business partner. This came to the attention of the insurance holder and Eric's business partner was restored as the beneficiary. So there was an email or an alert that went out and Eric saw it and his business partner did and they're like, that's weird. And at that point, I don't think, if I remember correctly, that um, they confronted Corey about it yet. They just changed it back to the business partner and then he changed it to his sister as well. End of January of 2022, Corey allegedly contacted a friend to buy prescription pain medication for an investor with a back injury. (laughs) Okay, then. Yeah, she's like, she's got an investor here. He's got a back injury. She needs some very strong prescription meds. So I think she bought hydrocodone at that point. Okay, then. Then on February 11th of 2022, Corey asked this friend if she could get something stronger. And she said, the Michael Jackson stuff. She bought $900 of Fent, is how I'm going to say it for YouTube. I don't know if that will help. Twice. She was making plans. Mm Mm-hmm. But sinister ones. Then on Valentine's Day of 2022, Corey got Eric his favorite sandwich from a local deli and left a note. He took a bite and broke out in hives. And he told two of his friends, actually, that he was very worried. He really thought that he could have died. He thought that Corey was trying to poison him. And he was staying in the marriage for the children, is what he said. But he was talking to divorce attorneys, right? Okay. (laughs) <laughs> Miss Jessica NB says, wait, I just have to quickly do this. Okay. Um, as a mortgage loan officer and formerly working in ACH or fraud risk department, the fact that she was so delusional, I think you should never get caught makes me sick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as mortgage fraud, what? US, mor- is it US mor- as mortgage fraud? 2008 to 2009. Yeah. The fact that she thought she'd never get caught is... <laughs> Okay, then. And she really, she denies all allegations. It's still one of those cases. And her attorney is doing a great job of being right by her side and fighting for her and all of that. Like, it seems like her attorney really believes her too, right? Um, Jean says, my heart goes out to the innocent kids. They lost mom, dad, and now maybe grandma. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Valentine's Day, he apparently grabbed his son's EpiPen and used that, which would be for uh, major allergic reactions. He took one bite and broke out in hives. And then he also drank, I think they said something like a bottle of Benadryl. And then he lay down to sleep it off, basically. And he survived that. Okay. Yeah. Joe Ann says, this is another case from where I live in Utah. That's true. This case, sorry, I didn't say. Um, it is all on the playlist, but this case does take place in Utah indeed. Okay. And not that it matters, but uh, Corey Richens was also a Mormon. Oh dear, making a bad name (laughs) for them. Lots of cases like that lately, huh, that we've been discussing. Okay, so March 3rd of 2022, Corey made Eric a Moscow mule. So it's a 
cocktail, right? To celebrate closing on a house. She made it in the kitchen. She brought it upstairs to the bedroom. He had the drink and apparently a THC gummy. And then he died. And she thought, no one's going to know. Like, who's going to know? No one's going to know. Who knows what happened? Must be that damn THC gummy. Now, if you have seen um, the playlist that I've made for you, if you remember those episodes, we went over the entire uh, police report, you know, the transcripts for the police interview and everything. So go listen to that. If you haven't yet, <laughs> that'll be your homework. <laughs> Here at Grizzly True Crime, you get homework sometimes. But the fact, everything she did, like saying she, was, she plugged in her phone to charge, then she went to go sleep in one of her son's rooms because the son has terrible nightmares. Then when she came back, her husband was cold to the touch. And she changed where he was, like at the foot of the bed and then on the bed. And then he was on his side. Then he's on his bed. All the stories changed. And when they checked her phone, they're like, no, this phone, there was like pacing around. The phone was doing things. She was texting. And I must mention now, she victim blamed quite nicely so far, even though she's innocent to proven guilty. She victim blamed quite nicely and blamed him for having an affair. But now it turns out it's actually her that was having an affair because there's evidence on her phone of that affair. That very night, she texted her paramour, as they're calling him. Her paramour. That's the word. That's the correct word. Uh, anyway, so um, saying love you with like a little kissy face, you know. Mm. So not only is, let's speculate, okay, it's speculation. Not only is life insurance and money, financial gain, a huge motive in this case, but also a new lover. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, T.Y.O. Toy says... Uh, I always hope I say your name correctly here. <laughs> you said investor, probably her paramour. Probably, yes. So on March 4th of 2022, Corey called 911 at approximately 3.22 a.m. saying oh, she found her husband deceased at the foot of their bed. Evidence shows that she used the phone a lot more than she had stated she had. Her story didn't make any sense. So that's a real bullet point. We've done a deep dive on that. So go check it out. Uh, an autopsy was conducted and it was found that Eric had five times the amount of the lethal dose of Fent in his system. Then, a few months ago, they said that the examiner also found um, an amount of, I have to say that right, quetiapine, quetiapine, described as an atypical antipsychotic medication that is widely used as a sleep aid. Now, we've gone over some emails that Corey wrote to the police department before, and those were cringy and crazy because she had all these, I'm going to show you an example of one, laughing emojis, and she's talking to them like, you know, like their best friends. The police must have been like, what the hell is this? I'll show you that in a moment. But she actually mentions that medication and says she's worried about it because, you know, she got prescribed it, but she was just asking about that. But yes, that was actually also found in his system. So that cocktail she made. Hmm. Five times the lethal dose. You know, I think they said that she bought something like 20 to 30 pills twice. Oh my word, did she think this is going to be, I mean, initially it was. Initially it was ruled an accidental OD. Until they got that search warrant, looked at her phone, you know, they were looking at her behavior as well, but looked at everything and they're like, this doesn't make any sense. Time for an autopsy and a full toxicology. So, yeah, she was arrested Um about a year later. In the meantime, she wrote a book. <laughs> she wrote a book called Are You With Me? by Corey D. Richards. See, now in this case, they apparently, uh, we did check last time, which was like nine months ago, that they'd pulled the book off the shelves from, you know, everywhere. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever. You couldn't buy the book. Why can't they do that when it comes to Jody Hildebrand, Chad Daybell, all those other ones? Take the books down. Anyway, this book is still there. It's a child children's book, and it's about how to cope with grief. So it's like telling the kids that, don't worry, your dad's still here. He's always here with us. I mean, if you think just of how sick that is based on the allegations, she's innocent to prove guilty. But, and her family backs her 100%. Her brother completely believes her, so she would never do this. I'll show you some clips of that. Her mother's also like, anyone who knows Corey would never do this. But now there's some red flags with the mother. Pure speculation as well, even though they're on, you know, documents, official documents. No one's being cuffed or charged. <laughs> At this point. So, you know, just to think that she would actually go ahead and write that book and profit again off it 
and says for kids, you know, and that interview, we watched it before. I'm going to show you it again. I'm going to show you some clips of it again because it just never gets old. It's just unbelievable what some of these alleged dumb criminals do, especially when they do interviews, right? Oh my goodness. So there's a picture of the book and you can see uh, the little boy. There's a little boy. They had three kids, right? But then there's uh, the dad in the corner there with angel wings and like, yeah, you know, wow. Can you believe it? Joelle said, wow, I'm a grizzly that lives in Utah. What in the world's going on? These people are giving us a bad name. <laughs> they are really amazing people here too. I believe it. Absolutely. You're a grizzly, right? You there? Amazing. Okay. You said thank you for all your amazing work. Thank you so much. So yeah, she appeared in the show in May of 2023, you know, because she's published the book and she's promoting it and like, whoa, the audacity of it all. <laughs> yeah, Stefan says her interview is cringe. If you've never seen it, oh, buckle up. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, buckle up, everyone. Almost buckled up too hard there, okay? <laughs> it's just like, wow. I, I'm actually jealous if you haven't seen it before because you're going to be like, she literally did this. And then she was arrested a month later. Yes, Michaela says a children's book. Mm -hmm. Una, thank you so much. From South Africa. So, now, the, the latest news is that she's just been hit with a whole lot of new charges because... Do you think that's the first time that she allegedly poisoned her husband? No, 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 no. There was the time he broke out in hives, right? February 14th of 2022. So they've actually added those charges now. Now she's charged with, uh, sorry, attempted murder as well. But a few years before, on a trip that they did to Greece, she apparently tried to poison him there too. That's what um, his family said. My goodness. So... Yes, she appeared on a show May 2023 to promote a book a month before she was arrested. Her new charges now include attempted murder, aggravated murder, two counts of mortgage fraud, two counts of insurance fraud, and three counts of forgery, two counts of distribution of a controlled substance. That's a lot of charges. So the more she's like, I'm innocent, I didn't do anything, and all of that, which she might be. <laughs> I personally doubt it, but she might be. She's innocent or proven guilty. In my opinion, ooh, the evidence is there's a lot. <laughs> and so... Wow. The more she's doing that, the more they're like, another charge, more, more. Because the investigation continues. That's what the prosecutor said. The investigation is continuing, of course. The more we dig, the more we find. She'll be in court on May 15th. I triple checked that date because I saw um, Jesse Weber on Law and Crime had said um, April 17th. But I can't find, I think that the date has been updated or something because it's on May, May 15th of 2024 that she will have a preliminary hearing where they're going to be discussing all the evidence in the case, which is also called an evidentiary hearing from everything I've read, where they will decide if this case has enough to go to trial, which in my opinion, I think it will, but we will see. So the reason I'm doing this update now is because I don't want to wait like, I don't know, what, a year, two years, five years. No, 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 no. We've got to keep, we've got to keep on it. We've got to keep going with this because I want to see this trial. I definitely do. So she has, if they stream it, of course, you never know. Uh, she has yet to enter a plea to the charges, but of course she always says that she is innocent. So, uh, let me just quickly go here. Okay, uh, Victor says, if the insurance was not in her name, what was her motive? Well, I think because of the trust and it being left to her kids, I think that would be one. And she had all these other life insurance policies that she would have claimed as well. And the assets. Remember, remember, with a prenup, it said, if, if they get divorced, Eric will get everything. But if he dies while they are lawfully married, she gets everything. So she was looking for the assets, you know, which included his company. They actually named a few in an article that I saw earlier. A forklift, uh, like all kinds of equipment. You know, lots of equipment, properties, all that kind of thing. Rob says, question, where are the children now? I'm not 100% sure. If anyone does know, let me know. I always feel, I, I feel like I need to work on checking that more. The reason I don't is because I feel protective, you know? I feel protective. And when people say, where are the children? I know we're all curious, but I, I, I'm kind of like, I don't know. I don't really want people to know, but I get. We want to know, like, are they safe? Are they okay? Are they being looked after by family? I think they're with Corey's mother or Corey's family from what I last read. And I know that the two families are fighting over the kids and both families are accusing the other one of saying whoever gets the boys gets the money so the families are not they're not friends they're not friends okay so 
on March uh, the 3rd, this is just some extra notes. March 3rd, 2022, the night of Eric Richards' death, prosecutors say Corey's paramour texted her a photograph of two people kissing that was captured in Love You, and then a little more than an hour later, Corey allegedly responded, Love You. Prosecutors also argued that the cash strap, Corey, she was cash strapped from flipping houses, and she owed, yeah, we're going to read it now, $1.8 million. So she needed money desperately. So they say, uh, the cash strap, Corey, mistakenly believed that she would inherit her husband's estate under terms of their prenup agreement Newly released documents indicated that she had a bank account balance in the red and owed lenders more than $1.8 million and was being sued by a creditor. So, imagine that. <laughs> being cash-trapped, wanting the money, the, the, the assets that she would get if uh, her husband died while they were lawfully married, and having a new lover. And shame on her then for accusing him of having an affair, Right? I don't know if he was or wasn't, but she was accusing him of it. Deflecting nicely, right? So, on March the 3rd of 2022, we already did that. Wait, we are. Okay, okay. So, now I made little bullet points, little crib notes, okay? I want to go over the walk the dog letter with you, just to tell you about it. Which she's been accused of witness tampering, because she, <laughs> she wrote a 60-page novel, a little fictional story, but in there she slipped in these six pages, which has instructions for her mother to tell her brother to testify, to kind of falsely testify. <laughs> wow. So we're going to go over the walk the dog letter, her affair. I've ticked that box. Okay. That allegedly she was having one. The mother's possible involvement. We're going to go over that now. And there's a new, uh, well, I think it's new. It's new on YouTube, 48 hour documentary, uh, if you haven't seen it. Okay. So now let's quickly get to, there's clips I want to show you and documents I want to show you. Now remember the second substance that I said was found in Eric's system, beyond the five times the lethal amount of fent. There's something else, right? So I just want to show you this email again, which was sent on April 17th of 2023, so shortly before she was arrested. She said, hey, after you guys left Friday, I was trying to make sure dates were accurate as possible, but I always feel like something was last year and it was actually several years ago. And then look at her laughing emojis. This is how she talks to the police. Anyway, you asked me when my doctor had prescribed this ketapine. I don't know. Ketiapine. I don't know how to say that one. Uh, I believe I told you a few years before Eric passed. However, I emailed my doctor today to get a specific date, and this was her response. I don't even know if this matters for anything, but it was bothering me. Also, Eric's company was started in 2010, not 2012. I think I might have said 2012. That's when we got married. Lol. I think they actually got married in 2013, but okay. And then she said... <laughs> She literally writes lol to the police. Oh my goodness. Again, none of this probably matters, but it was bothering me. Oh, she wants to clear up, like, wait, in case you guys want to know when I was prescribed that, that, that subsidy, um, let me just tell you when it was, like, why, why, why is she bringing it up? Red flag, right? Red flag. Carla says, what if her paramour was her book publisher? Oh my word. Yeah, what does the paramour do? Who's the paramour? <laughs> okay. So, Here's this document. I don't want to uh, keep you too long, you know, or bore you with documents. So what I'm going to do is, it's this document, right? An, an affidavit for a search warrant. It's just been unsealed. This obviously is all about the law enforcement officer's background and everything. And they say he's held various assignments, including field training officer, canine handler, UAS pilot, firearms instructor, SWAT sniper, all of that. Okay. So... On March the 4th of 2022, at 3.22 hours, Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call. This is now going to be about the mom later, right? I've redacted this document as well so that we don't uh, put people's names out there who, who shouldn't be there. Quitapine? You guys are like, Quitapine? <laughs> is that how you say it? Tiff Knox says, Quitiapine. Now that sounds a little more accurate. Quit. <laughs> I love it when you, guys, when you guys write this out for me. Quitiapine. Quitiapine. Thank you so much. Okay. So this is the police narrative. We, I, do, I do love these types of documents. I don't know about you, but I'd just like to see, you know, our bullet points and overviews and presentations, and then we go into this. So on March 4th, 2022, at 322 hours, Summit County Dispatch received a 911 call from a female party later identified as Corey Richin about an unresponsive male. The male was Eric Richens, Corey's husband. Deputies and EMS staff responded to the residents to attempt life-saving measures. Life-saving measures failed, and Eric Richens was declared deceased. Man. Okay, deputies held the scene and requested they met the medical examiner's office as well as detectives from Summit County Sheriff's Office uh, respond to the scene. 
While waiting for detectives and the ME investigator, Deputy Nguyen conducted an initial interview with Corey Richens. Corey stated that she, Eric, and Corey's mother, remember that, okay, remember that, Lisa Darden had been celebrating Corey closing on a house for her business the night before, around 2100 hours. Corey stated they had a drink to celebrate. Now, that becomes interesting based on the bottom of this document. It's eight pages long. I'm going to just power through this now because we've got very interesting information. But the fact, I don't think we knew before that her mom <laughs> was there celebrating with them. Did we know that? I don't think so. I think that's a little bit new. Okay, so I'm going to show you clips after this as well. They said, Lisa Donnan. So Eric, Corey's mother, and Corey's mother, Lisa. So Corey, Eric, and Lisa Donnan had been celebrating Corey closing on a house for a business. But even that story is sus because apparently she actually only properly closed on the house the next day. And she even had the audacity to have a huge party at that house the next day. <laughs> and the people who attended, I don't know if they knew that Eric had died or not, but she was partying it up. Oh my goodness. Um, it's on the playlist on those episodes. We looked at that little detail before as well. Corey stated that they had a drink to celebrate. Corey stated Eric then went to bed. Corey stated that she went to sleep with one of their children due to the fact that the child has night terrors. Corey stated she woke up around uh, 0, 0300 hours, so 3 in the morning, and came back uh, to she and Eric's bedroom. Corey stated at that time she felt Eric and he was cold to the touch. That is when she called 911. After determining that Eric's death was not likely due to natural causes, his body was transported to the medical examiner's office to perform an autopsy. And they would do that if they think, this is a little unusual, right? After approximately three weeks, toxicology findings from the autopsy were available. It was determined that Eric died from an overdose of Fent. When speaking to the medical examiner's office, the doctor indicated the level of this in Eric Richens' body was approximately five times the lethal dosage. The medical examiner determined that the, I'm going to just say Fent, okay? The Fent was illicit and not pharmaceutical grade. It was also the opinion of the medical examiner doctor that it had been ingested orally due to the gastric fluid contents. After receiving the information regarding the toxicology, a search warrant was obtained for Eric and Corey's residence. During the service of that search warrant, Corey's phone, as well as several computers, were seized as evidence. And we've gone over her Google searches before. So if you haven't seen that, I'm not just saying it. <laughs> like, go and watch my previous episodes. I'm not trying to promote the previous episodes. Like, for real, we went over it. You need to see the Google searches the transcripts from the police interview and everything that we went over because it's, I don't know. I was watching some of it again today myself. <laughs> of course, on 1.5 speed. I'm just like, what, what? I'm like, oh yeah, those Google searches. Oh my goodness. So yeah, they found a lot of digital evidence as well. They said uh, several computers were seized as evidence. Warrants were obtained for all the electronic devices and the information from those devices was downloaded to be investigated. When investigators went through the information from Corey's phone, it appeared that several text messages around the time frame from March 1st through March 15th had been deleted. Mm, it's also about what they delete, huh? The time surrounding Eric's death. Several communications between Corey and CL were located. Now, we've heard of that CL before, the person who provided her the Fent and the Michael Jackson stuff and the hydrocodone and all that, okay? So I've redacted this as much as possible. They put a full name in here in this document, which I don't know if it's supposed to be like that. Welcome, Peter Pronzo. Okay. Uh, through the course of the investigation, detectives began to investigate individuals close to both Corey and Eric Richards. During that time, CL was identified as being a housekeeper often used by Corey for her residential real estate business. A police records check of, uh, redacted, revealed multiple counts of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute possession of a controlled substance and possession of drug paraphernalia. They also had charges of theft, DUI, burglary, and aggravated assault. Due to the fact that Fent dis uh, was discovered in Eric Richens was illicit Fent, it is or was plausible that this person was the source of it. While conducting an investigation into that lady, there's two dudes here. <laughs> they say one guy was identified as an associate of the lady. This guy has a chemistry degree and had, pre had been previously charged in Heber City with clandestine lab charges for operating a meth lab. This is like Breaking Bad now. <laughs> what? It was also learned that this, this guy 
has a boyfriend named who is currently incarcerated at the Utah State Prison in Gunnison. After learning this information, detectives spoke to staff at the Utah State Prison and requested his phone calls made from March 1st through March 15th. During one phone call between the one guy and the other on March 2nd, he answers the phone and states that he's on a break from drug court. It was verified through court records that CL and the one guy were in drug court together at that time. At 2.32 into the call, they say, tell CL I say hi. A female can then be heard in the background saying, hi, honey. And then they respond by saying, hi, her name. On the 3rd of March, 2022, they called phone number. That is one of the phone numbers investigators identified as belonging to CL. Remember, CL is the lady that Corey contacted to get the stuff, okay? Allegedly. <laughs> the remainder of the call is discussing a possible mutual acquaintance that they know in prison. On 0304 2022, this one guy makes a phone call too, and during that phone call, they are discussing purchasing an Xbox controller for them while he's in prison. They make a comment that he would pay for the controller and then responds by saying, you or the lady, one of the two. They then respond by saying, I tried giving you that itch. <laughs> I tried giving that itch $100 yesterday and say, hey, let me pay you back. I'm paying you back. She's all WTF. No, you keep it. I just made $1,000 selling effing Fent or some ish like that. That call between the one guy and the other guy occurred at the on the same day that Eric Richens died. So they have a lot of evidence, digital evidence against Corey. Not only her communication with the lady that she got the stuff from, and she told the lady to leave the stuff at one of the houses that she was, you know, busy with, because she's a real estate agent. Just leave it there, okay, and I'll fetch it later. So they've got communication between them, but also between these other people. So I'm sure they'll be called to testify at the trial, if so. On 3-27-2023, CL was arrested on misdemeanor traffic offenses and booked into the Wasatch County Jail. On 5-2-2023, myself and other detectives interviewed her while she was in custody. Post-Miranda warning, this lady admitted to supplying Corey Richards with 15 to 30 Fent pills on two separate occasions, approximately one month before Eric's death. She stated that Corey paid her approximately $900 each time that she supplied the pills. She provided details of the solicitation of the drugs, the pickup, drop-off locations, and other pertinent details that has been corroborated with digital forensic evidence. <laughs> Heather says, not looking good for her. Yeah, I know, right? Not looking good for her. Okay. Uh, Brenda, I missed your message earlier. You said, I live in Utah. I know the Britchens family. I'm so glad you are covering this case. Oh, thank you, Brenda. And if you guys have never seen me cover this case before, there is a whole playlist for you and we've done some deep dives. Okay, so check it out. Thank you, Tiff Knox, for <laughs> censoring that. It does help. Otherwise, YouTube flags the chat, right? Since when do rug, you know, carpet and <laughs> rug dealers give product away? Mm -mm. So $900 twice. She's like, I just got this. So they say, in investigating, now look at this, because now enter, remember, Corey said it was her, her mom, and Eric that was celebrating the closing of this house? Well, well, okay. In investigating Corey Richens' associates, it was discovered that in 2006, Richens' mother, Lisa Darden, was living with an adult female with whom she was having a romantic relationship. In April of that year, her romantic partner died unexpectedly. An autopsy report of the female partner showed that her immediate cause of death was a drug poisoning from an overdose of oxycodone. Further investigation showed that Lisa Darden has been named as the bene had been named as the beneficiary of her partner's estate a short time before her death. The female did have current prescriptions for oxycodone and reportedly struggled with abusing her meds. She, however, was not in a state of recovery from addiction at the time of her death. Based on my training and experience, and you saw how much training this officer has, right? This would likely rule out the possibility of an accidental OD. Oh my. <laughs> the plot just thickened. This is almost like, uh, it reminds me a little bit of the Adelson case. <laughs> because it's starting to be like, whoa, so like Corey's... It's almost like Krzyzewski and Adelson are just like all these cases all in one. Like, oh my word, what is happening here? You know, with the family trying to help out and 
this one's going to testify for that one and what? Okay, so in reviewing forensic downloads of Corey Richens' phone, it's clear that she's very close with her mother and communicates with her almost daily, both for personal matters and in her business dealings. Conversations have been found on Corey's phone showing disdain for Eric on Lisa's part, as in Corey's mother didn't like him. Based on Lisa Darden's proximity to her partner's suspicious OD death and her relationship with Corey, it is possible that she was involved in planning and orchestrating Eric's death. Like, what? Now, uh, she hasn't been arrested. She hasn't been charged. These are pure allegations. This is just suspicions in this document. <laughs> I'm actually amazed that they just put this out there like that. I'm like, whoa, because nobody really knows, but they're obviously busy investigating it. And maybe they'll put it all together, especially with the former partner's death as well. So imagine, so I say, like mother, like daughter, like, whoa, imagine if it's Corey allegedly murdering her partner. And imagine if she learnt it or was inspired by her own mother. Oh, my. So on 5 8 detectives served a search warrant on Lisa Darden's house. Wow. Okay. A blue Samsung cell phone was recovered and identified as her current cell phone. I'm applying for a warrant to search the digital contents of that phone. Oh boy, I wonder what they found. <laughs> now we know that the mother didn't, so far, so far we know, the mother didn't like bring the fent over from what we know because Corey had obtained it from this other lady, CL. So Corey was very much orchestrating her own thing and she'd already attempted to do something, allegedly, to Eric, her husband, on Valentine's Day uh, of that same year, and years before, tried to poison him in Greece, apparently. <laughs> Can you believe this case? Okay, so, quickly here, then I have to show you clips. Maybe I should, yeah, okay, let me show you this first. Here they're talking about a 60-page letter. Okay, this, <laughs> 60 pages of the defendant's non-privileged fictional manuscript, a fictional manuscript that Corey Richens says that she wrote, okay? Now, the thing is, <laughs> let's see how this all started. The state of Utah moves this court pursuant to, and Utah, to compel the defense to produce the prosecution to the prosecution approximately 60 handwritten pages of paper. Damn, she's beating Jesse Krzyzewski at that writing, huh? <laughs> let's not get Corey Richards flu now. Um, referred to by the defendant as a fictional manuscript. This document, handwritten by the defendant, was carried out of the Summit County Jail by defense counsel in violation of jail policy. If you watch the Kershevsky trial with me, you know I'm, why I'm like, whoa, okay, really, really, and then what happened here? Okay, during the state's aggravated murder prosecution and its wit uh, witness tampering investigation, the defendant has stated that the walk the dog letter, WTD letter, now you know the lingo, <laughs> is part of this fictional manuscript, okay? The defendant described the WT, the walk the dog letter, as Part of like a 65 page freaking, <laughs> that's how she talks, freaking mystery fiction novel I've been working on. Half the story is true, but there's a lot of parts that aren't. Mm, okay, but again, she did write 65 pages of something, lots of crap, but in it was six pages, a six page letter slipped in there meant for her mother. Oh, yes, asking her brother to falsely testify about where Eric got the drugs. That's what she wanted. Okay, so this walk the dog letter has caused a lot of, a lot of um, obviously legal trouble for her as well because the prosecution is on it. I don't know how they found out or if they, then maybe the defense did the right thing, of course, and filed it and it was like, I don't know what this is or whatever, but they found out. So they say, oh, there we go. On September 14th of 2023, Summit County Sheriff's deputy seized the document written in the form of a letter with the phrase, walk the dog. Now, Corey's mother says, no, she looks after her, I think she said 16-year-old dog. She says it in the 48-hour documentary, which I'll link for you in the description box if you haven't seen it yet. No, man, she was just asking me to, like, walk her dog, right? <laughs> but I think it was more like code word. <laughs> That's what people are gathering. Handwritten on the top margin. I'll show you the letter right after this. The walk the dog letter was found in a law school admission test, LSAT prep book, inside. Oh, inside the defendant's jail cell. The letter includes defendant's instruction to her mother to induce her brother to testify falsely. 
Later that same day, defense counsel visited the defendant at the Summit County Jail. According to the defense counsel, the defendant passed her an envelope labeled Sky Lazaro. That's her attorney's name. Trusting defense counsel and on the basis of her firm's solid reputation in the legal community, Summit County Sheriff's deputies did not search defense counsel or inspect the envelope for non-privileged material when defense counsel departed the jail. It is now known, both on the basis of the defense counsel's admissions and the defendant's statements in recorded jail calls, that the envelope contained more than 60 pages of the defendant's non-privileged <laughs> fictional manuscript. The defendant claims the manuscript is a non-fiction telling of events of her homicide case up until her detention hearing. At that point, the fictional manuscript allegedly transitions to a fictional story involving bail jumping, fleeing to Mexico, and incarceration in a Mexican prison. Based on the defense counsel's statements, the envelope also contained a non-privileged letter to the defendant from another inmate. It's unclear what, if any, additional non-privileged material may also have been inside the envelope. Okay? So then she goes on and complains about it. I put all these documents on Patreon as well, if you want to see it there. So, I don't want to uh, bore you with it, but that's basically what happened there. Now, this is the... Wait, this is on... Yeah, it's on the first page, so that's good. Okay, here's the letter <laughs> that was also part of it. Walk the dog. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Here we are at letters again. <laughs> Stefan's like, a non-fictional fiction novel. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And Rob says, she's so full of crap. Yeah. <laughs> Heather's like, I can see Corey using air quotations like, walk the dog. <laughs> and then it says, but take vague notes so you can remember. There's a little star there. Let's see where else is the little star. Where's the little star? Because she put a little star there. Ooh, there. Mmm. Oh boy. Look, look. Walk the dog, exclamations, but take vague notes so you remember. Then she puts a little star. <laughs> and when we go down here, we find the star. Oh, there it is. It says the connection has to be made with Mexico and drugs. Ronnie will have the messages to prove that Eric confided in him about getting high. Mmm. Okay, but we've got to start here. So... It says Sky is saying, even if the gummies have fent in them, the prosecutor will say, I tried to put the fent in the gummies. It was part of her Google searches if THC gummies could maybe contain fent. It's part of her Google searches. It's pretty premeditated, in my opinion. Okay. <laughs> if you haven't seen the Google searches, it's on the playlist. So they say, they're going to say that I tried to put it yeah, in the, in the gummies. So Eric would have them. Stupid, I know, but that's what she's thinking. We will still test them, though. However, she wants to link Eric getting drugs and... What the hell does that say? And... Something from Mexico. Pills and pills from Mexico. So we need some kind of connection. Yes, an asterisk. <laughs> Thank you, Annie P. An asterisk. Yes, it is indeed. I'm like a star. <laughs> She's putting a little star, everyone. <laughs> Were people asking? Yes. <laughs> so they say... So we need some kind of connection. Her private investigator is doing some research on the ranch or cartel place that Eric would stay at. Oh my word. She's like, cartels, Mexico. <laughs> oh, you want to blame him again? Okay, okay, I see how you roll here, Corey Richards. Mm -hmm. Here's what I'm thinking, but you have to talk to Ronnie. Ronnie's her brother, by the way. I'll show you clips of him in a moment. He would probably have to testify to this. Probably like... <laughs> He probably won't have to testify. <laughs> right. Okay. But it's super short. Not a lot to it. He will need to tell Sky, that's her attorney, at the meeting next week. Upon information and belief, just like they say. Oh, my God. Just like they say. A year prior to Eric's death, Ronnie was over watching football one Sunday. And Eric and Ronnie were chatting about Eric's Mexico trips. Eric told Ronnie that he gets pain pills and fent from Mexico from the workers at the ranch. Not to tell me because I would get mad because I always said that he just gets high every night and won't help take care of the kids. There are pictures in my phone of Eric passed out on the floor or in the chair. Ronnie should have the text from Eric's talking about getting high as well. Eric told Ronnie that he keeps getting them in an allergy pill bottle in his uh, work trap, so I wouldn't find them. Ronnie never told me about the conversation. Eric finally told um, told the Eric finally told me and asked if C could
could get him some. Eric never wanted anyone to know that he had an issue, especially get caught. He always wanted Corey to go down for him. When they traveled, Eric would put his drugs in Corey's bag at the airlines <laughs> right before they boarded. That way, if they were caught, Corey got in trouble and not him. Once they got to... Now she's writing almost in third person here. She's writing the narrative for her brother. Once they got to wherever they were going, Eric would pull the drugs out of her bag. It would cause a huge fight. She was pissed that he would risk her going to jail for his drug use. She just would laugh about it. Eric would uh, ruin his image that he had drug issues, so he would do whatever he had to. Corey has never done any types of pills. Didn't like them. Rarely would she consume THC, only if Eric begged her because it was a special occasion. Reword this, however, he needs to make the point, just include it all. The connection has to be made with Mexico and drugs. Ronnie will have the messages to prove that Eric confided in him about getting high. He can be short and to the point, but it has to be done. <laughs> Upon information and belief, lol, she literally... <laughs> what a dumbass. She literally writes, upon information and belief, lol. Which obviously means laugh out loud, if you don't know. Lol. They never found pain pills or faint in my house because he hid it in an allergy bottle in a work truck. And Cody emptied out the work truck within a week, so they were never found. When you talk to Ronnie about this, meet up with him in person. I worry sometimes your house and phone are bugged. Oh, don't worry, they got that phone now. <laughs> Maybe drive down to Salt Lake, I think SL Salt Lake, and meet him after work without... Brie. Sky has to make the connection between Eric and Mexico because that makes the most sense in her mind. If it's Ronnie's information and belief about the conversation over football that she can use that as a connection, tell Ronnie, don't overanalyze it. It was a quick two minute conversation. Lol, tell him I need him to do this. Bring me home and then we'll get those damn bitches. <laughs> what? Also, please text Lotto or call. Tell him to. I don't know who these people are. Tell him, do not text me anything about us doing things together. Ever. Like church, skiing, trips. Nothing that puts us together. It doesn't look good. Oh, you're worried about how it looks now. Damn, this letter. We're so close to the end. Let's push through. Have the conversation with Ronnie before he meets with Sky. Then tell him to tell Sky at the meeting about the conversation. Hang in there. We're almost there. Love you to the moon. What about and back? What about and back? <laughs> Take vague notes of all this so you remember before you walk the dog. Okay. Uh, Bijou Bug says, how do you know you never liked pills if you never took them? <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. So, yeah. Okay. Again. You can see why it reminds me of Koshevsky. It was about to be sentenced. I can't wait. Okay, I saw a commercial yesterday. Utah Mortgage Relief. Google them, please. It's for people behind on their mortgage. Does this sound like fictional to you guys? It's just a fictional novel, man, that she was writing. Just these six pages are a little bit different to the rest of the 60 pages, but okay. It's just something she was writing, working on. You know, she's an author and all. We're almost done. We're on page four of six. It's for people behind on their mortgage. Can you see if they can help at all on Mar Marissa's house, please? We have to get hers, yours, and Chelsea's taken care of ASAP. ASAP. Try to go to that place in Kamas. What about asking Lotto to do... I don't know who all these people are. I hope it's not the children's names. I'm sorry if it is. I hope not. Um, <laughs> I know he can do a home equity line. Now she's still trying to do business from behind bars here. She's in jail waiting... <laughs> well, waiting for an evidentiary hearing, uh, clearly. Preliminary hearing, as it's called. Um, and she's doing all this. It's not going to help her, right? <laughs> Amy Short says, I think you're really becoming this character. You're getting into it. I'm getting into it. Okay. <laughs> Oh, man. So they say, and welcome, Amy Short. So they say, oh, man. Okay, okay. I know he has like a million in equity. Maybe he just doesn't know about it. Uh, home equity. If he wants to help me, taking care of these loans is most important. She's still after the money. I don't give a SH1T about the, does it say Yotels? It looks like Yotels. Okay. Remember I told you, one, day, one, one way to get at Katie who's Eric's sister, one way to get at Katie. I think that's the one she punched over the whole trust thing. Wow, okay, one way to get at Katie is going through my phone and finding a picture of her girls, even with the boys. Print 
15 copies and send them out anonymously to different media companies. Obviously, don't email the pictures so it's not traceable. She would be livid if it got out to the public. You would just have to do it sneakily and be careful. She <laughs> would try and trace it back to you. If not, no worries. Wow. Okay, I'm not going to read the rest because I'm worried that the kids' names are in here. But you can see how crazy it is, okay? Walk the dog, the letter. Wow. Okay, so now I want to show you some clips here, which would be this one. Okay, let's resize it. This is Sky Lazaro, I think her name is Lazar, Lazaro, Corey's attorney uh, in the first clip. But actually, I want to show you clips of her mom in case you've never seen her. Corey's mom, right? Okay, wait, let's put the sound on for you. Okay, here we go. So what I'm going to show you now is just a few clips from the 48-hour documentary that's been released recently. And so that you could see Corey's mom based on the recent allegations, speculation about her involvement, possibly. She's not been charged. She's not been arrested. I can't even say yet because we don't know if she will be, but they're looking into things. They're looking into how her partner died suspiciously and all of that, as we just said, right? So I'm going to show you clips of that. I'll pause here and there, and then we're also going to just one more time just watch uh, Corey Rishen's book promotion interview just a little bit, okay? They had it all. I mean, it was one happy family. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call, and it was Corey, and she said, get up here. Something's happened to Eric. He went to sleep and never woke up. But I thought you were there at 9 p.m., lady, celebrating with him. Are you lying? Or what? Because she's like, whoa, I got this call and just said, oh my goodness. Maybe she maybe she was there, she went home or whatever. It just does, It's just not sounding like it. She's a complete wreck. She's sitting on the couch. This she's is her appalling. brother. Corey denies any involvement in her husband's death. For anybody who knows Corey, just knows she could not have done this. Um, the allegations, they're, they're hard to listen. This is her brother, okay? Listen to, but at the same time, I know that they're just that. They're just allegations. Uh, they have nothing substantial on her at all. Um, if and when this actually goes to trial, um, I have complete confidence that it's, uh, we have all of the proof to disprove everything that's, that they're trying to claim. Ronnie, why are you so certain that Corey did not do this? Because I know my sister. Um, my sister. She can't even squash a spider. Um, she loved Eric. Uh, she loved her family more than anything. Um, and I, you know, I hate to say that unfortunately she's being painted in this light uh, for um, really bad reasons, um, really selfish reasons. Um, so either he's in major denial or he's lying for his sister. I don't know which one it is. <laughs> Stefan's like, Corey could never do that. Lot. And you heard it from the mother and the brother now. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I like how you guys are using this new emoji. Bull cuck. If you don't know, cuck means S-H-1-T one T <laughs> in uh, Afrikaans, which is from South Africa. I'm from South African, as you know. Okay, so bull cuck. <laughs> and so, you know, we just, we've got to get through that. Um, again, I know my sister very, very well. And anyone that actually knows her, uh, no, she's just incapable of, of doing that. Um. Sibling or a friend talking about loss with kids can be a tricky. Oh, yeah. One month before she got arrested, she's sitting on the right hand side there on this Good Things Utah interview promoting her book. <laughs> Are you ready? Is there anyone here who has never seen this? Please say yes. <laughs> Don't just say yes. But is there anyone here who's never seen this? You're going to see something. Look at her. She's just like, yeah. And then I wrote this book and like, oh, wow. The subject. Okay. Joining us now is author of Are You With Me? Corey Richens to share her three C's to helping kids cope with grief. And Corey, I want to start with your story. What happened in your personal life? So my husband passed away unexpectedly last year. So it's March 4th was a one year anniversary for us. And um, he was 39. Damn, yeah, he was 39 years old at the time, by the way. I think she's 33 currently. Eric Richens was only 39 years old, and his whole life was about his three boys. He loved them so much. And he was allegedly murdered. But she's like, yeah, it's the one-year anniversary. No, 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 no. It completely took us all by shock. Um, and we have three little boys, 10, 9, and 6. And... Um, 
you know, we kind of, my kids and I kind of wrote this book on the different emotions and grieving processes that we've experienced last year and, you know, hoping that it can kind of help other kids, you know, um, deal with this and kind of, you know, find happiness some, some way or another. And to make sense. Let's see, people pick up. <laughs> what would well Freya she says many many times many many times okay thank you Shauna you said I've recently followed a few true crime channels have been covering cases personal local to me you our mods in this community are a cut above 100% thank you thank you so much Shauna okay and process I'm yes. sure and I'm yeah. sure you felt that going mm -hmm. through and trying to explain it and articulate it for you and your boys yes exactly exactly and so I've done you know I'm new to all of this so kind of doing all you know research and reading books and things to try and understand you know not only how to grieve as a widow as a, as a wife but also you know with my kids how to help them how to help them they pick it up yet like, damn, imagine taking a sip of water every time she said, you know, 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 you know. Okay, now you're not going to be able to unhear it. <laughs> Sorry about that. understand what just happened. And um, what I have kind of found is, as I mentioned, it's kind of the three C's is how I has visualize it. And it's, you know, um, connection, continuity and care. And it's, you know, making sure connection is the one major one and making sure that their spirit is always alive in your home, you know, and memories are always brought up and doing things that your loved ones love to do, whether it's riding bikes or their favorite dinner and just constantly, you know, talking about them. And, and Corey, do you mention at dinner, here's dad or dad would like this meal or dad yes. would, yeah. let's bring dad on a bike ride. Yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, explaining to my kids just because he's not present here with us physically, that doesn't mean he, his presence isn't here with us and he's doing these things with us. And he's, you know, here for birthdays and he's here for Christmas and, you know, and it's just comforting to them to know. It's like, don't worry that he's not here anymore. He is. Okay? He's still here in every way. He's here for Christmas, birthdays, and everything. Just needed him to go because clearly she needed his money. And she has a new lover. So, wow. That's all alleged. Okay? <laughs> Fernil's like, and I chose this hairstyle and I love it, you know? <laughs> yes, she did. It did. Know that, you know, they're not living this life alone. Like, mm -hmm. Dad is still here. It's just in a different way, a different version. Well, I opened up your book, and one of the first pages I saw is a little boy. It looks like he's standing in a hallway at school, and he's mm -hmm. saying, are you still here? Yes. Yeah, and it's, you know, and that was, like, the first day of school. And, you know, all the nerves that kids face on the first day of school with new, you know. And just hoping, you know, Dad, like, walk with me. Like, help me get through today. Like, give me the strength to do that. Um, and it has found, you know, a, it's been a lot of peace for my kids to, you know, to really remember that in the back of their head that they're never alone, you know, so. So you actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm -hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you th go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night. And I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. And so, you know, I took things that my kids have said to me this last year and we kind of articulated it and put it into a story and, you know, just have hopes that it will help yeah. other kids. Jogoshi says, ghost writer wrote the book. It was found out. I vaguely remember something like that. <laughs> she didn't even write it and she was planning a sequel as well. Grief is not linear, and this mm -hmm. sounds like it's a touchstone when you need it to come back to for you and your yes. boys. So the first one you had mentioned was connection of the three C's, keeping mm -hmm. the person's spirit alive. The second, continuity. Yes, and that's, you know, just making sure you're trying to stay, you know, as, as much as you can on routine. And, you know, whether that's, you know, sports drop, 
you know, sports or pick up and drop off from school or community activities. Just, you know, trying to stay in a routine as much as possible. And then the last C is care. Yes. What does that mean? So, you know, on top of just loving your kids and hugging them and kissing them and, you know, extra cuddles and everything, I think it's important that I've learned to really affirm, you know, their feelings. When they're mad or they're sad, you know, it's just that affirmation of, I understand, like, that you are upset, you know, because of this. Like, let's talk about it, you know, and so I think really it's not you know it's the emotional and physical touch of it but really letting your kids understand that you know why they're feeling the way that they are feeling and it's okay and let's deal with it and talk about it why does she not feel any kind of way well we know the answer you know but <laughs> she's only describing how the kids are feeling it's pretty obvious right she's not like dealing with grief herself there's a promotion right now get a free copy of the book april 30th and no 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 Okay, let's just uh, power through these last, I think it's 15 seconds. Here we go. May 1st through Amazon Kindle. You are an amazing woman and mom, and thank we you. thank you for being vulnerable and sharing this and touching the lives of others. Thank you. I really appreciate being here. So, thank, thank you, you Corey. Guys. Thank you. Okay, then. So, you know, that's <laughs> what we got for today. I hope you feel all caught up. Uh, now we know. You know, she's got new charges. She was allegedly the one having an affair. There's this walk the dog letter. She's accused of witness tampering, although the judge, there was a whole uh, legal issue with that, of course. And the judge said that the, the state didn't prove enough for witness tampering, for her to be actually charged with that. But we could see from the letter, she definitely tried to reach her brother and make him say stuff to her lawyer so they can make a connection, you know, to try to blame Eric for his own death. Wow. Okay. Giovanna says, anyone count how many times she says, you know, you know, I think we did that as well, <laughs> like nine months ago when we were looking at that interview. I think we were also like, you know, you know, <laughs> Carla said, not connection, connections. Yeah, with an X, like Jody Hildebrand, right? Oh, dear. <laughs> so I think we all caught up for now. We've got all the main bullet points. You've seen all the main things. If there's any further updates, I'm going to let you know. Of course, uh, the the next time she's in court is... May 15th. May is a very, very busy time. My goodness. On, wait, we must get this little diary here. What's the date now? Today is March the 30th. On April 5th, Jesse Krzyzewski will be sentenced. Then May 9th, I think it is, it's Adam Montgomery's sentencing. He's trying to still not be there. And then May 13th, Stefan Stern's trial, uh, Richard Allen trial in Delphi. And then May 15th, Corey Richens is going to be back in the courtroom and they're going to decide if they have enough to go to trial, which I think they do. There's no, <laughs> Double Z said, is there no thriller date yet? No, not yet. They've got to go through that preliminary hearing first, which I see on some articles, they're of course calling it a evidentiary hearing. That makes sense to me. Like, do we have enough evidence to proceed? The state will present their case and all that to trial, right? Hecky B <laughs> says, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So... Yes, that is what's happening next. So the next thing in this case is that very important date. Let's see what happens. Steel Guitar says, will you cover it, G? I would love to. I would love to. I've actually watched quite a few of her. We've actually watched some of them together. It's on the playlist as well. Some of her hearings, especially as she had a bail hearing. There's been a few uh, since then as well. But I would love to see what they say. Is this going to trial? I think it will. So um, Arctic says, Chad, April 1st. Yes, so Chad Dayball's trial is starting on April 1st. It's going to last... Eight to ten weeks, which includes one to two weeks of jury selection. I'm going to do my best to offer recaps on that because there's many factors that I'm a little concerned about. <laughs> one being it's like a zoom view because the judge is controlling the camera. So that's not very nice for us as well. Two, I want to check the quality of things. But three, I also, I don't know, I want to commit to eight to ten weeks of only doing that because when I only do trials, I only do trials. I don't want to miss all this other stuff I just mentioned. You know, Kershevsky's sentencing, Montgomery's sentencing, um, all these things. The Delphi trial, I think we're going to get audio. I think we might get audio. Whatever we get, I'm going to be covering. I don't want to miss all of that. So I want to make sure that I manage my energy correctly and hopefully I can offer you some good recaps, okay? So, oh, Hope and Fear, you're so right. You said Boone 2 on the 13th. <laughs> now, Sarah Boone's trial has been postponed many times, but it is currently set also for May 13th. May 13th? 
Stefan Stearns, Richard Allen, Sarah Boone. Oh man. Okay, so we have a lot, a lot of true crime to do. And as you know, I work on my own, so <laughs> I want to get to all of it, okay? <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone who's sending me coffees and things. You keep me going and PayPal's for support and joining Patreon and all the things, becoming members. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you for the stickers today as well. Um, please do like and share. That will help others learn about this information. And let's keep an eye on this case. I'm also keeping a close eye on the case of that dentist in Colorado who allegedly poisoned his wife with cyanide in her smoothies. Remember him? James Craig? Yeah, I'm keeping an eye on that one too. I want to bring you an update if I find anything soon as well. So <laughs> Heather N says, those are, uh, those are other three C's. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let me quickly see some of your comments. Gaynor says, I agree, G, not worried about watching Daybell Trial. Yeah, and we've heard a lot of the information before, right? Because Lori Vellows was audio only. At least here we can see it, but let's see how much we can actually see based on how they're going to have the cameras. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Mods. I really appreciate it. I hope you guys are having a wonderful weekend. I will keep you posted. There's many cases. There's so many shorts I want to make. So check out my YouTube shorts section. I'll be making things there soon again. Check out the community tab because there's also there's many places I share updates because there's just so many updates. Oh, my goodness. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much and see you again very soon. Bye.